can't women become priests? 1-833-288-EWTN. I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. 1-833-288-3986. What's stopping? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? You, you, you? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. It's the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Do you have a question or two about the Catholic faith? And maybe there's something you're just not sure about. Well, we can help you out with that. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us in Denmark, please dial 1 and then 205-271-2985. Or you can text the letters EWTN to 58177, wait for our response, and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. Of course, you can always uh, shoot us an email if you would prefer that, ctc at EWTN.com. All kinds of ways to contact the program to get that question to us. Charles Beery is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener. Rich Jesse is handling social media for us. If you all want to check out YouTube or Facebook, we're streaming on both those platforms right now. If you have a question uh, while watching YouTube or Facebook, put your question in the comments box if you would. Rich will see that. He'll send it to us here in the studio, and off we go. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Very well. How are you, sir? I'm doing decent. Thank you. Fascinating question. You're going to love this. This is from Joey. Hi, Tom and Dr. Anders. People have called about purgatory the last few days. This is true. When asked, the late Father Benedict Rochelle replied, Well, where do you think you are now? God is hidden, you're suffering, and hopefully becoming a better person. So, I please ask Dr. Anders if life on earth is purgation. Thanks, all the best, Joey. Well, you know, you put me in mind uh, of—this is kind of funny, but when when I first read Martin Luther's 95 Theses, Uh and, and, and Luther had kind of a tortured, emotional life, so, you know, life wasn't easy for him— and uh, he, he, of course, objected to the Catholic uh, practice of penance and eventually, and indulgences, and eventually he objected to the Catholic doctrine of purgatory as well. But one of the lines in the 95 Theses was essentially, what do we need purgatory? Life itself is a living hell already, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so that was, I was taking the, the point a little bit too seriously. Yeah. But, but no, actually, that is Catholic doctrine. The Catholic position is that life is hard. Life is difficult. Suffering is inevitable. Mm-hmm. And to the extent to which that we freely submit to the will of God and say, like Christ did, not my will but thine be done, then then that suffering can be uh, expiatory. It can be sanctifying. It can be cleansing and purifying. It's only when we refuse to do that, when we kick against the goads, as it were, uh-huh. that uh, that we, you know, sort of rack up... Um, uh, debt to be paid that it worked off in purgatory. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, Joey, thanks so much uh, for your email. Here's one now from uh, Michelle. Dr. Anders, if, quote, full of grace is the most accurate rendering in Greek of Luke 128, why do none of the mainstream Catholic translations of the Bible use it? It's very confusing when someone who is a Protestant boasts that, quote, even Catholic Bibles don't say that. I thought I learned or read some time ago that the original King James Version did use full of grace, but I can't seem to find that either. Please help. Sincerely, Michelle. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to try to make a subtle point here, and I'll see if I can do it succinctly. It is one thing to exegete Scripture. It is another thing to formulate and defend Catholic dogma. Catholic dogma is in part not entirely, but is in part grounded in the exegesis of Scripture. But the Catholic Church has never taken the position, well, I won't say never, but it is, it's is—it's not the position of the Catholic Church that Catholic dogma just is sort of note for note a, uh, a, a reduction of the biblical exegetical teaching. Right? Now, that, that is the fundamentalist view. So the okay. way fundamentalists think about their own doctrine is they think that you can simply go from the the literal words of sacred scripture right to the page of their doctrinal statement with no in between that all they're doing is reducing the content of scripture to a kind of abstract formula and voila you have christian doctrine mm. the catholic view of christian doctrine doesn't work that way scripture informs christian doctrine to be sure but so does sacred tradition 
uh, which can develop and, and express itself in different idioms and, 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 and concepts over time. And so uh, exegetes, including Catholic exegetes, are aware of that fact. Devout, Orthodox Catholic exegetes are conscious that, that exegesis is one discipline and dogmatics is another discipline. And for that reason, when they choose to translate scriptural passages, I can understand why a Catholic exegete would say, I believe in the doctrine of uh, Mary's plenitude of grace. I mean, that is Catholic dogma, and I believe it. But I also think that if I, if I render the text exactly that way, that the risk of the reader is that they will, they will jump immediately to the Catholic dogma without perhaps considering what other truths the text might have to communicate. And, and it is a value to Catholics to read uh, the texts of the Gospels within their own context and on their own terms with an understanding that those very same concepts and terms over time will give birth to theological developments that are legitimate but distinct from the texts themselves, if you follow what I'm saying. Yes. You know? And uh, and so, you know, there was an ancient practice of harmonizing the Gospels. You read all four Gospels, and then you write one narrative that tries to squeeze them all together. And and again, that's that, that synthetic drive to kind of reduce the Gospels, you know, to some kind of single coherent doctrinal framework. Mm-hmm. And I understand that impulse. But there's also an argument for reading Mark as Mark, yeah. reading Luke as mm-hmm. Luke, understanding yes. that the Gospel writers are complementary but that they don't say exactly the same thing, and they have different theological agenda. And if you don't approach them as individual works of literature, you're going to miss out on some of what the Bible has to offer you. doesn't mean you can't do the synthetic work later down the road uh-huh. and formulate it all as Catholic dogma, but you have to take the text seriously as text. And those kinds of considerations, I think, would probably weigh into a Catholic translator's decision to render a, a word one way or the other. Michelle, thanks so much for your email. If you would like to send us an email for a future show, here's the address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. By the way, you can still text us. Text the letters EWTN to 58177. In a moment, we'll get to the phones. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833 833- 288-3986. It is called to communion on this Thursday afternoon here on EWTN. Do stay with us. The Children's Rosary is a simple and deeply moving prayer experience where children pray and learn more about the joyful, luminous, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries of the rosary. Visit EWTN.com slash kids for more. Join Archbishop Jose Gomez in sharing the good news. Remember Eucharist is a new Easter. The risen Lord again comes into our midst and He speaks to us of His love. Then He shows his love for us all over again, offering us his body and blood in the bread and wine, giving himself to be our food. Like those first Christians, like the Christians of every age, we need to make the Eucharist the center of our lives. Jesus comes in the Mass to open our hearts and minds to understand the beautiful promises of sacred scriptures. We hear the words of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, and then we hear our Lord's own words in the Gospels. Every time that the Mass is celebrated. Visit lacatholics.org to find ways to connect with our faith community in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. This is Dr. Matthew Bunsen. Join us for the news and topics that affect your life on Register Radio, Saturday afternoon, 4 Eastern on EWTN Radio. 24-7 24-7 Catholic Radio, this is EWTN. Glad you're with us for Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Lines are open for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. Uh, if you call now, well, then you're going to get in. 
but if you wait till uh, the last mm, 10, 15 minutes of the show, you may not be able to get in. Again, that number, 833-288-EWTN. Brand new from EWTN Publishing, Spiritual Lightning, answering your call from Jesus to Master His Values by Deacon Richard Eason. You know, St. Paul was struck down by divine power from a bolt of spiritual lightning. Well, in our own lives, we also experience moments of spiritual lightning, whether uh, subtly, dramatically, or even circumstantially. Through personal anecdotes and inspiring stories, Deacon Eason reveals how to develop strength and courage during times of suffering and ways to obtain healing. He shows you how to garner the benefits of, quote, autopilot faith, and develop trust in God through prayer, leading to positive transformation, spiritual tranquility, and increased joy and happiness. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Check out this great book, Spiritual Lightning, answering your call from Jesus to master his values by Deacon Richard Eason. We are publishing it and very glad to be doing so. It's available right now at EWTNRC.com. Buy Catholic, shop Catholic, EWTN. RC.com. We will get to the phones in just a moment here. Here's a question uh, that uh, Jacob just texted to us. If Christ wants his church to be under one communion, why can Protestants not partake in the Eucharist? Precisely because they're not under one communion, ah. right? Because the Eucharist is, among other things, um, the, the token and the means of of bringing about the the full unity that Christ desires in his church, meaning that if you go to communion in the Catholic Church, you are confessing by your action that you believe this is the one church founded by Christ with which you are to be in communion. Right, right. And that you affirm what she teaches. And in the, the larger context of that passage in 1 Corinthians is Paul's insistence that Christians agree on everything. And that's those are his exact words. Mm-hmm. I insist you agree on everything. Mm-hmm. And, and so the Protestant who wishes to receive communion in the Catholic Church could do so for a good motive or a bad, or maybe good and bad is the wrong word, could do so for a motive that would be consistent with Catholic teaching and a motive that would be inconsistent with Catholic teaching. I'll put it that way. Here's the motive that would be consistent with Catholic teaching. The Protestant said, you know what? I, um, I've come around to believing the truth of the Catholic faith. I think that what the Church teaches is what God has revealed, and I think that the Church is, in fact, the institution founded by Jesus, and I want to be in communion with that Church. So I want to be in communion with that Church, so I'm going to submit myself to its authority, accept its doctrines, and voila, I'll become Catholic. That, that's, that's, a, that's a good motive for a Protestant to want to involve in Catholic communion. Here's what I'd say would be a motive that would not be consistent with Catholic practice. Uh, Protestants who says, you know, I, I personally, I consider the true Church of Christ to, to be everybody that has genuine, or, or I should say sincere faith in Jesus in their heart, and that the, the ecclesiological trappings of, you know, church government and popes or pastors or whoever, or all the rest of it, traditions, those things really don't matter. And, uh, and so when I go to communion in the Catholic Church, what I'm saying is, I'm okay, you're okay, we all really believe the same thing, and when we, doesn't it, when we don't believe the same thing, it doesn't matter, and and like I accept your church and you accept my church and we're all one big happy family because we all have this sincere faith in Jesus. Well, the Protestant who holds that is basically asking the Catholic Church to concede his doctrine of the church. He's asking the Catholic to concede Protestant ecclesiology and the principle of denominationalism. And so that's that's really not fair. You know, it's like the the church doesn't think that's what the church is. And so if we admitted to Protestant to communion on that basis, we'd be telling a lie about who we thought we were, right? Or we'd be inviting him to tell a lie about who he was, because he'd be demonstrating by his actions a doctrine that he doesn't actually believe in his heart. Mm. So that's a major reason why it's not a good idea for Protestants to present themselves for communion. Now, there is an exception to that rule. The Church says if a Protestant is in danger of death, and he has Catholic faith in the sacraments, so he's really heading towards that Catholic point of view, then he can have Holy Communion in the Catholic Church. Now, there's another consideration as well, and that is that St. Paul tells us that to receive communion in an unworthy manner is actually spiritually dangerous. Now, some Protestant communions, actually quite a few of them, don't have that concept, right? They, they actually think that, that for a soul in mortal sin to approach communion is proper, 
because communion is sort of the seat of God's mercy, and the soul that's sort of tormented by guilt and so forth will be consoled by communion. It might be a motive for them to, to reform their life, and so it's actually appropriate for somebody who is in a bad moral state to approach Holy Communion. And that's very different from the Catholic point of view. Right? Consistent with St. Paul's teaching, the Catholic position is if you approach uh, Holy Communion and you're in the state of grave sin, that you actually do harm to yourself. Now, we have a way of preventing that in the Catholic tradition. It's because we have a disciplinary structure in the Church where that disciplinary structure stands as a barrier between the individual and Holy Communion. And you have to pass through the tribunal, the judiciary, if you will, of the confessional Mm -hmm. before you can gain access to Holy Communion. Now, precisely because the Church does not judge Protestants. St. Paul says, judge the people inside the Church, don't judge those outside. Precisely because the Church does not judge Protestants, um, they are literally outside our jurisdiction. Being outside the Church's jurisdiction, the Church can't form the judgment, you have faith, you're penitent, you're contrite, and you're properly disposed to receive Holy Communion. And so, you know, it's like, here's an analogy. If you're, if you're driving down the road at night and you see something move in the road and it's dark and rainy, and you think that could be an empty cardboard box or it could be a child, you don't floor the gas, you put on the brakes, Yes. right? Since the Church is not in a position to determine <clears throat> the disposition of the Protestant who is not within its jurisdiction, the safe option is to say, don't go to communion. Yeah. Because it's risky. It's only when you know that the person is has the proper disposition, and that, of course, can only be ascertained in the context of the Church's disciplinary structure, i.e. the sacrament of penance. So it really is in the best interest of the Protestant all around not to go to communion in the Catholic Church, unless, of course, they believe the Catholic faith, in which case they should become Catholic. Y'all come. And uh, Jacob, thank you so much for your question. If you're ready now, let's go go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN, beginning with Larry, a first-time caller from Houston, listening on the great Guadalupe Radio, AM 1430. Hey there, Larry. What's on your mind today, sir? Uh, Well, great to be on the program. Thank you for this program. It's a blessing to us all. And uh, I'm a practicing Catholic and believe that Jesus Christ uh, is our risen Savior and the Son of God. And my question is, how is it that he is also referred to as the son of David? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. Well, there's an interesting way in which son of God and son of David actually are kind of synonymous terms. Mm. And that is that originally in the Old Testament, and not just in Hebrew religion, but in many ancient Near Eastern religions, the king uh, was obviously very involved in the public cult, the public worship of the god or of the gods in the case of Israel's pagan neighbors. Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, and was understood to function as God's vice regent. And the, the theology was that on ascending to the throne and being anointed, that the monarch would be adopted by God, and therefore uh, he would be called the Son of God. And, and so this is, this is I'm, just, I'm not talking about the Christian view yet in the New Testament, I'm just talking about the ancient Near Eastern view, that a royal person— could could legitimately bear the title Son of God without all of the Trinitarian trappings that that'll eventually come to hold within the Christian religion, and so uh, Psalm one ten, you know, which is which is understood to be a messianic psalm, but also had a meaning within the corporate life of ancient Israel. You know, you are my son today; I have begotten you. The context of the composition of that psalm was actually. Uh, this was a this was a, a song of ascent of you know a, a royal ascent of someone ascending to the throne and receiving receiving anointing and and, and functioning as Israel's temporal monarch. Um, now the monarchy in Judah was Davidic, meaning that the line of kings in in the kingdom of Judah descended from King David, and they were both uh, Davidic in the sense that they had David as their ancestor. And uh, in a very extended sense, they were sons of God, you know, in, a, in that minor kind of way, in that they were understood to be God's vice regent, and they were responsible for maintaining the covenant and all that kind of thing. So in that kind of lesser sense, Jesus was certainly certainly son of God in that sense, and I'll get to the more elevated sense in a minute, um, precisely because he was Davidic, precisely because he was understood to have been an heir, a lineal descendant of King David. And the prophet Samuel, in the book of Samuel, 
uh, God promises David that he will never cease to have a descendant on the throne of Israel. And, uh, you know, it's a dilemma, actually, if you don't hold to the Messiahship of Jesus. If you don't actually think that Jesus is the Messiah, then you kind of have to scratch your head and wonder, well, what happened to God's promise of an eternal Davidic monarchy? Right? If you're Christian, then you go, no problem. Jesus is king forever. So, like, you've got that one down in the bag. Like, yeah. God's promise was fulfilled. Israel, all, and for that matter, the world, always has a Davidic monarch. Mm -hmm. The humanity of Christ descends from the line of David. Now, now, what the Christian church did is say, okay, that's true, he's the son of David. He's the son of God in that ancient Near Eastern political sense, in that he, you know, God's vice regent on earth. But he's the son of God in also a far more exalted way, because we begin to learn from the Gospel of John, from the hymn in Philippians, from the book of Colossians, that Christ is a divine figure, a cosmic figure, who eternally pre-existed with God. And so this begetting that we're talking about is not just a begetting in time, not just a temporal adoption, uh -huh. but also an eternal begetting where the Father eternally begets the Son, this eternal procession of Father from Son that is the ground of the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity. And so he's Son of God in a, in a kind of a mundane way, but he's also son of God in an ontological and eternal mystical way that has to do with the essence of the Blessed Trinity itself. Larry, is that helpful for you, sir? Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I I I expected a simple answer, and that was beautiful. So um, thank you very much. Thank really you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. And that opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288. 288-3986. Call to communion on this Thursday afternoon here on EWTN. Let's go to, to uh, Denise now in Denver, listening on the great Catholic radio network. Hey, Denise, what's on your mind today? Well, hello, hello. Thank you. I'm so excited to be talking to Dr. David, um, longtime listener. I'm a convert to the Catholic Church uh, from the Pentecostal Church, and um, just get a lot of information from you. Thank you for for just doing what you're doing, my friend. Um, I, I had a question. I um, I have a lot of dear friends who um, are lovely Christian uh, people in my life. We we just love to share Christ with each other and our love for our Lord with each other. Um, they choose to um, have, I guess, Bible study prayer service in their homes. Um, and say, you know, this is how Jesus did it. This is how the early disciples met in their homes. And so don't really believe in, you know, coming into a church building with um, other believers. And really, I have a, a, a close friend who feels like this is the way it should be, that she's following Jesus. I guess I, I would love to know from Dr. David, like, um, when did that, when did it change where it was like, let's come together as a community in a, you know, in a church building, you know, and not in our homes? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can address before. that. So, so first of all, from a Catholic point of view, the important thing is not the architecture. And so, well, there is an historical answer to the question, why did the church begin to meet in buildings? I can answer that question. It's not difficult to answer. I think it's the wrong question to ask, because the Catholic Church can also and sometimes does meet in homes. So that's not really what's at issue. What's at issue is precisely the role of the sacraments, the liturgy in Christian life. The real point of difference that we want to draw when it comes to the question of worship with our Pentecostal friends is not, again, not the question of the building, but of what you do when you're there. And for the Catholic Church, the, you know, Christ doesn't say a lot about the formalities of Christian worship other than the command, do this in memory of me. And so the heart of Catholic worship is the Eucharistic sacrifice, which we, of course, believe to be the real body and blood of Christ and a true sacrifice that we offer to God for the redemption of sins. Now, your Pentecostal friends probably say, well, we also celebrate communion, and we can do that in our home just as well. And so the other point of difference to emphasize is that for a Catholic, precisely because the Eucharist is a sacrifice, it is, it is officiated by someone who has a sacrificial office, namely a priest, that stands in apostolic succession to the apostles. And so uh, 
you, you read a book like the book of Acts, where worship is taking place in private homes. You get to Acts chapter 14, and what do you find out? The apostles appointed presbyters in all of the churches that they founded. And so there's a hierarchy put in place by the apostles. You mm-hmm. read the pastoral epistles, Timothy and Titus, and you find that the apostles' intent was that those appointed individuals would, in fact, also appoint successors. Paul says to Titus, the reason I left you in Crete was so you could appoint successors. And so the real point of difference in terms of the content and nature of Christian worship is, for us, the heart of Christian worship is the Eucharistic sacrifice presided over by a priest that stands in apostolic succession to the apostles. And so that's, uh, and, and, you know, one that has authority, the authority to bind and loose, to, to remit or retain sins, to teach, to govern, to sanctify. And so that's the real point of difference. Now, in terms of the, of the chronology of the thing, um, you know, by the time you get to the fourth century, the churches are, are populous enough that you can't fit everybody into a home. And there's other reasons, too, that are really interesting, but I don't have time to go into them right now because here comes that music. Yeah, Denise, thanks so much for your call. In a moment, we'll take uh, Camille in New Jersey, Claudia in Oklahoma, and hopefully you as well. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover. I do a lot of research and try to dig out the bits and pieces of a life or of an agenda that people don't want to talk about. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. Tonight, 8 Eastern, on EWTN Radio and Television. This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, president of Life Issues Institute. The liberal media and pro-abortion activists lost their minds when the Arizona Supreme Court ruled a 160-year-old law prohibiting abortion was still valid. Originally, it was the result of President Lincoln requesting a lawyer write a legal code for the new state of Arizona. Tucked inside was the protection for the state's unborn babies and their mothers. A similar version of the code was later codified into Arizona's criminal code. This is a great example of the judicial branch not legislating from the bench. They admirably interpreted what the law said instead of writing their own like the U.S. Supreme Court did with Roe in 1973. There are bound to be challenges to this ruling, so please pray that God's will prevails. Follow us on social media at Life Issues Institute. EWTN Radio is all over social media. All your favorite programs are available right now on demand for you to listen or download. Check us out on SoundCloud. Look for EWTN Radio. Remember, EWTN is everywhere. On the next More to Life, red flags. Seeing warning signs in your relationship? Let us help you find grace-filled solutions. That's on the next More to Life. Now back to Called to Communion with Dr. David Anders. Called to communion with Dr. David Andrews here on this Tuesday, uh, th- Thursday afternoon here on EWTN Radio. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Or you can text the letters EWTN to 58177. Hey, our friends in Western Iowa need to hear from you next week. Siouxland Catholic Radio will be airing their spring pledge drive, and that's going to be Tuesday through Thursday. So if you're listening in Sioux City or Storm Lake or anywhere, please remember to support your EWTN Catholic radio station. You know, back in the day, Mother Angelica, our foundress, said, uh, hey, we'll be glad to provide absolutely free programming for any radio station up to 24 hours a day, but uh, y'all are going to have to raise your own operating expenses. Got to pay the light bill, got to pay the internet bill and things of that sort. So uh, that's why we always ask you to support your local EWTN Catholic radio station. All right, let's go to uh, Claudia right now, a first-time caller from Oklahoma, listening on the great Oklahoma Catholic Broadcasting. Hello, Claudia. What's on your mind today? Yes, hi. Uh, Thank you for taking my call. I listen to your program all the time. And um, I, I, my husband and I had a question because um, we baptized our nephew when they were Catholic, you know, what, 27 years ago. Um, and the mother 
you know, my sister, she changed. Um, she's Baptist Protestant. And so uh, the other day I saw that my nephew uh, got rebaptized, uh, you can say, because they put themselves in a tub and they just asked them for their names. So he just answered, you know, his name. And then they just said, you're baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, I cried the, the entire day because I was like, well, what's happening? Because, you know, we baptized him. So it was very emotional for me. And I just wanted to know is how can they be rebaptized if, I mean, even though he doesn't follow the Catholic um, religion, I mean, you know, faith anymore. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So, of course, the Catholic Church teaches that you, you, you can't be rebaptized. that if you're baptized once, you've clothed yourself with Christ. And that's what St. Paul says. He says, whoever has been baptized has clothed himself with Christ. He's died with Christ and risen again, and so there's, there's no need to do that again. And to do so is to really deny the, the truth of the gospel. It's to deny that we can, in fact, be sacramentally joined to Jesus at all. And so the Catholic Church has always said, you don't, don't do that. That's a, that's a wrong practice. There, there, from the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, there have been those who argued against the Catholic practice of the baptism of infants. They argued against that practice, and they argued that for baptism to be valid, that it had to be performed on, on uh, expressly consenting adults, people that had a conscious faith in Jesus and had made a willful decision to follow him, and that baptism was not so much the cause of our regeneration as its public expression and witness. And so with that different theology of baptism, they would say, well, if, you know, if someone has sort of had a conversion experience in midlife and decided to dedicate themselves to Jesus, then the appropriate way to signal that to the community is to by submitting to this rite of, of public baptism by immersion. That's a different theology of baptism, but it's a very common one in the Protestant world. And so a Catholic who is no longer practicing the Catholic faith and has been indoctrinated into, into that form of Protestantism would naturally submit to their understanding of baptism. And, you know, as a Catholic, the way, how do I regard that? Well, you know, obviously it's wrong to do that, but I understand that the person who does this is likely operating in ignorance. They may not know the Catholic teaching. They certainly no longer hold the Catholic teaching. And so in their case, it probably really is a sincere effort to do the will of God and to follow him according to conscience. And so even though it's misguided, it's not malicious. And and so I want to judge that person very generously and understand that they, they do what they do through ignorance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, St. Paul once said that before he came to Christ, he was a murderer and a violent man but that God had mercy upon him because he acted in ignorance. Yeah. And uh, church recognizes that if you act in ignorance, then that can be excusable and we can be patient with you before you come back to the truth. Uh, is it, uh, in the end, uh, a harmless thing for Claudia's nephew? No, uh, it's not harmless. It's not har I didn't say it was harmless. Okay. Right? It's not okay. harmless. The reason it's not harmless is that he has, he has swapped the fullness of the Christian faith for a distorted version. I see. Where he will not get the fullness of truth and the fullness of the means of grace. Uh, and so that's that's very unfortunate, and it'll make it harder for him to live the life of sanctity. But again, you know, I, I judge not lest you be judged. Right, so I right, can judge right. the activity is objectively wrong, but the soul I put in the hands of God. Claudia, thank you so much uh, for your call today. Here is Camille in New Jersey, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Camille, what's on your mind today? Hi, Dr. Anders. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I have two questions, and I am uh, asking for my daughter, who has her boyfriend is Protestant. Uh, this is about sin, and where uh, the question is, where in the Bible is the differences between venial and mortal sin, because Protestants believe that that sin is sin, period. And the other question would be infant baptism. And I think you've explained some things with the previous caller, which was great. Um, but I, th I think this gentleman is wondering, um, how does baptism even work? I think it's a sacramental issue that happens with Protestants, if you don't um, understand what I mean. Yeah, thank you. So let's, let's go to the mortal venial sin business first. 
So several passages of Scripture uh, suggest this distinction quite strongly. First, let's just talk about the category of mortal sin before we deal with venial sin. And that is the idea that there are sins that can put you outside the grace of God and will ensure that uh, your damnation, effectively, if you are unrepentant about them. And that's something that Protestants in general don't agree with. They, they don't think that there's any category of sin that can put you outside redemption if you've been justified by faith. I mean, this is critical to Luther's understanding of the gospel. He says, it's, you know, we're saved by faith alone, not by any moral uh, commitment on your part, not by any sort of moral behavior on your part. And so there is literally no behavior, however odious, that can put you outside redemption if you have, in fact, been legitimately justified by faith. And the Catholic position is that faith is absolutely necessary to salvation, but that you can put yourself outside of redemption through particular acts. And, and from that, there's plentiful sacred scripture, but I'll, I'll give you one in particular. This is from Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, um, where St. Paul says, "...the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Wow. Um, and he says, if you live like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's categorical language. If you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, period, end of paragraph. Uh, there are also mortal sins of omission. Jesus lists them in Matthew 25 when he says, if you fail to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, shelter the homeless, visit the sick and the imprisoned. You will also not inherit the kingdom of God. Right? So the idea that there are concrete acts or, or failures to act that can imperil our salvation is deeply biblical. All right? Now, um, the, uh, the, as far as the distinction with venial sin, uh, St. James says in chapter 3 of his epistle, he, he says, you know, we all stumble in many ways. But the man that can control his tongue is a perfect man. And then he goes on to exhort people to control their tongues. But the, the whole context of the passage seems to be an acknowledgement that the, the everyday course of Christian life is characterized by imperfection, an imperfection we should strive to overcome, but one that nevertheless vitiates a lot of our moral activity without ever suggesting that, that, that those peccadilloes themselves constitute a sort of grave rupture in one's fellowship with God. Now, St. John makes that point explicitly in 1 John chapter 5, where he says, there is some sin that leads to death, i.e. mortal sin, and other sin that does not lead to death, i.e. venial sin. That's 1 John 5. And then also I'd say that, that we can, that some of this distinction is born out of the wisdom, not, not only of sacred scripture, but the wisdom of Catholic uh experience and, and wisdom down through the ages. In the early church, there was for a while the belief that, uh, uh, that there was no reconciliation for mortal sin, that once you were baptized, you had a moral obligation to live a perfect life a la James 3, and that you could not, you could not sin in any capacity without losing it. And they would allow one act of repentance and reconciliation, but after that you were toast, quite literally. They put you out of the fellowship of the church. And that, that position was widespread. It was called the doctrine of the second repentance, and it was held by people like Tertullian and Clement of Alexandra and the shepherd of Hamas, among, among others. So, you know, prominent people in the ancient church. And it was actually the pope who said, uh, nope, sorry guys, Jesus said forgive 70 times 7, so we're going to reconcile these people no matter how many times they've sinned. And uh, they didn't like that, so Tertullian left the church. But, but the, what everyone agreed was that you couldn't be in the fellowship of the church with unrepentant sin, right? That, that there were sins that would put you outside of redemption, and that the sacrament of penance and absolution had been appointed to deal with those so that you could be brought back into fellowship. And then over time, you know, the church lived this life of, okay, where do we draw the line and say this person is outside the fellowship of the mm -hmm. church and where, mm -hmm. you know, they need penance and where are they, you know, just sort of the daily peccadilloes of, of everyday life. And, and Augustine talks about this in his, uh, in his sermon to the catechumens, and he says, look, there are those people that have to do major penance for major sins. Others of you, you know, you can rely on the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins, you know, as we forgive our those who trespass against us, and that kind of gets the job done. So 
Yes, it's in Scripture. It was also something born out of the wisdom of Catholic experience. Um, now, as far as the uh, and the Protestant position, see, is that every sin is mortal, and that and that sinlessness is impossible. So the classic Protestant position is that you are just always and everywhere in the state of mortal sin, but God doesn't hold it against you. That He just He just imputes Christ's righteousness to you for Jesus' sake, and so He accepts you as righteous, even though you remain objectively sinful. Mm. And that's just not biblical at all. Okay. All right. Now the the uh, the question about infant baptism. So, um, uh, baptism reconciles us to God, washes away original and actual sin, makes us members of Christ's body and priests in the Catholic Church. We die with Christ through baptism and rise again, rise again with him to new life. Right? And he who has been baptized has clothed himself with Christ. That's all Scripture texts I've just quoted. Um, is it to be applied only to conscious, confessing adult believers? Well, not according to the Bible. So when Peter preaches his sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and the folks ask him, what do we do now? He says, well, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children. Repent and be baptized. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children. Which is why in subsequent chapters of the same book, like Acts chapter 16, when the Philippian jailer comes to believe and is repents and is baptized, so is his household. Mm. Right. So it's there in sacred scripture, and the principle is this: that you know, in the old covenant, the sign of covenant inclusion was circumcision, and it was applied to the children of believers, or the children of, I should say, covenant members. And uh, are we to hold that God is? is less generous with the dispensation of his grace in the new covenant than he was in the old. Well, far from it. More so. He, he's giving more grace to more people. If he didn't withhold grace or covenant membership, covenant inclusion from the children of, of covenant members in the old, uh, how much more is he going to include the, the, the children of the new? And this, uh, this, this analogy between circumcision and baptism is found in two places in the New Testament. One is Romans chapter 2, and the other one is Colossians chapter 2. Camille, thank you so much for your call. Call to communion here on EWTN. Be sure to join us for Pro-Life Weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern, right here on EWTN Radio. This week, Monse Alvarado brings you expert analysis on treating gender dysphoria. Also, how the U.K. has banned the use of puberty blockers. Big news there. Check it out, Pro-Life Weekly, right here on EWTN Radio, Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. All right, let's go to uh, John now, a first time caller in Northeast Pennsylvania, listening on JMJ Radio. Hey there, John. What's on your mind today, sir? Hi. Uh, I had a question. Uh, my wife, she's Lutheran, although uh, I'm, I'm Catholic. Uh, she did uh, let my kids uh, go to CCD, and so they were raised uh, Catholic. But my wife wants to, she wants to mess with me on and off, but she won't become a Catholic. I don't know why. She's just stubborn. Or what she might have her own reasons. But my question is in her church, they give a host and they give wine. Uh, and, you know, for, God, for Jesus suffering and dying there. In our church, in the Catholic Church, uh, we only get the Eucharist. And uh, we do not get any wine, which would be the, the blood of Christ. And my question is uh, why is that? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. Um, so to be clear, the Church does celebrate the Eucharist with bread and wine. And in fact, if you have only bread in the Eucharist, you don't have a valid Eucharist. You have to have both bread and wine. And there is communion in both kinds, in bread and wine, at every Mass. Now, sometimes it's only the priest that communes in both kinds, and the laity may receive only the consecrated host and not the wine. But but the ritual is still the same in that you have the consecration of bread and wine, and both are consumed at least by one person, namely the priest. Sometimes the laity do commune in the sacred chalice of, of Jesus' precious blood, and I have many times, although it's not my normal practice, I have definitely received uh, the precious blood from the consecrated chalice on many occasions, and in some Catholic parishes it's the norm. In some of them it's the norm. And, of course, in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, it is also the norm that 
the faithful would receive in both kinds through intinction. The, the sacred host is usually dipped within the chalice, and then they receive both in, in one spoonful, literally take it off a spoon. So it, it is the Catholic practice to celebrate communion in both kinds. So the more specific question is, why is it often the case that the laity receive only the consecrated host? And uh, here's the reason why. Uh, first of all, the reason that you have two kinds, I mean, the purpose of having bread and wine, is not so that you can have something to drink with your food. Right? <laughs> That's not so I can wash down the bread. That's not why you have it in both kinds. The reason you have it in both kinds is that the the bread and wine that are consecrated to be Christ's body and blood um, show forth, they represent, as it were, the separation of Jesus' body from his blood that happened at Calvary. You know, we say in the Eucharistic prayer that this is the memorial of his death. And the way we memorialize his death is by ritually demonstrating the separation of his body from his blood. That's why you have two kinds. If you just had the, the sacred host, you'd have a you'd have a ritual demonstration of the body, but not of the death, right, you see. And so, because that's the reason, once you have the consecration of the host on the altar, the host and the chalice on the altar, the reason that there are two kinds has been satisfied, you see. Now, uh, that's part of the answer. Here's another answer. Because we think that both consecrated species really are the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, we treat them with reverence. And it's just very easy to spill liquids. It is. It's possible to spill solid matter, but it's but it's very easy to spill liquid spill liquids and much harder to clean them up. Yep. And to avoid the risk of scandal in the handling of the precious blood of Christ, the church is reserved about distributing the chalice to the lay people. And we are consoled with this realization that when one receives the consecrated host, one receives the blood of Christ in the consecrated host, because what is in the host is Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's not just his body. Right. Right. And so there is literally no need for the laity to receive in both kinds. There's, there's just no reason to do it. John, thanks so much for your call. Here is Kaylin now in Omaha, and uh, Kaylin is listening to us today on Spirit Catholic Radio. Hello, Kaylin. What's on your mind today? Hi, Dr. David Anders. Um, I have a question about uh, pregnancy and uh, specifically trisomy 13 and 18, and was curious what the church's uh, teaching is if a mom finds out that their baby has trisomy 13 or 18 during pregnancy. Um, if there's, uh, I guess, what the, what the church is teaching is. So. Yeah, thank you. So I will confess to not having personal deep familiarity with this with this chromosomal defect so i and i and i can't i can't say that i have read a position paper by catholic ethicists on this condition specifically so what i'm going to say here is based on general principles not on my knowledge of this specific condition but the church teaches that the that the fertilized zygote is a human being and so whatever you do to the fertilized embryo from conception on, you do to someone who is a human being with the dignity of a human being. Uh, so, for example, something that would definitely be ruled out is the intentional destruction of the fetus because you anticipate that this child will live a difficult life. I wouldn't do that any more than I would say, you know, Tom comes in and says, you know, I'm, I, th I think I'm, I'm feeling a real whopper of a headache coming on. And I'd say, I've got the perfect solution to your problem, Tom. I've got a revolver in my pocket, and I'll blow your head <laughs> off. Then you won't suffer from your headache, right? That's true. Like, murder <laughs> is not a solution to the problem of human suffering, no, right? And no. it's not true for an adult. It's not true for a child either, okay? So that abortion is out of the question, out of the question. Um, medical interventions uh, in utero that... that could potentially help the child are absolutely acceptable, including risky ones. So if you said, okay, there is a prospect that this treatment could, uh, and I, I don't know that this is the case, I'm just shooting from the hip here, you understand, I don't know the medicine. But if you said, well, this, you know, this procedure might possibly kill somebody, but it also has a non-negligible chance of, of arresting the development of this disease and really leading to a positive outcome, 
you can make a kind of prudential judgment about the wisdom of that, and you could legitimately go forward. I mean, we do this all the time in things like heart surgery. Sure. You know, like this heart surgery might kill you, but if you don't have it, it's not looking good for you. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you roll the dice and decide that that's a, that's a justifiable risk. Those kinds of considerations can also, can also, uh, can also hold in, in, uh, in utero procedures. Kaylin, we hope that's helpful for you. Thanks for your call from Omaha. Here is Michael now, a first-time caller from Ottawa County, Michigan, listening on Holy Family Radio. Michael, what's on your mind today, sir? Thank you. Your show is awesome. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes go right ahead. All right. Well, first of all, I love your show. It's been on Family, Holy Family Radio in Grand Rapids for over 20 years. I love it. My question is, I listen to, I go to I'm a Catholic. I go to Catholic churches, different churches in the area, but also I have friends that are Protestant. And I notice nobody, no priest or minister talks about the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm not saying they have to preach about honor thy father and thy mother, but they could say before church is done, remember to honor your mother and father this weekend, or remember the Lord's Day. See you next week at church. Nobody talks about the Ten Commandments, and yet we're all going to be held accountable for the way we live our lives following if we don't follow the Ten Commandments. So I'm confused a little bit here. So they don't have to talk about the Ten Commandments anymore, either sure. Catholic or sure. Christian? Thank you. So first of all, when it comes to the, the normative status of the Ten Commandments in Catholic life, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is the authoritative go-to document, is uh, is firm that Catholics are obligated to follow the Ten Commandments, and in a very robust way. Meaning, we're not just limited to the literal text of the commandments, but it's a kind of metonymy where you know, like, don't commit adultery actually includes don't commit any kind of sexual offense against human dignity. I mean, it's, it's very expansive the way you interpret them, and you'll find all that commentary in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, when it comes to the preaching of individual clerics, like, there is such a thing as clerical incompetence. I, I once listened to a homily uh, from a priest that was not in my diocese, and I won't say where to spare everyone's dignity, um, but it was uh, on the eve of Holy Week, and he literally preached about the color of his socks, and I'm not making that up. Wow. And I thought, I have never been subjected to such pastoral <clears throat> mismanagement in all of my life. The guy was just unprepared and, and, and incompetent and incompute, basically. So there is such a thing as pastoral incompetence. But I wouldn't want to presume that in the majority of cases. And so here's how I kind of intuit the answer to your question. I think the Ten Commandments are implied, or should be implied, in all of the homiletics that you hear over the course of the year, but the way they often come out is going to be, um, you know, you might have a gospel reading that uh, that implicates, say, um, you know, uh, the sin of uh, well, the sixth commandment, the sin against uh, purity, and so you'll get it, you'll get uh, exhortation about about sexual purity. Mm -hmm. Well, at, boom, you've just done the sixth commandment. Uh, you may have a gospel passage that talks about. Um, you know, uh, 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 material possessions. And that might be an occasion for the priest to mention, you know, not coveting your neighbor who just got a raise, yeah. and so on and so forth. So over the course of the year, the underlying moral catechesis is going to be consistent with all the Ten Commandments without maybe explicitly enumerating them. Um, now, there, there should be readings in the lectionary where, you know, we're going to hit Exodus 20 in the lectionary where you get the Ten Commandments. Yep. And you're going to get Mark chapter 10 where Jesus says, hey, go obey the Ten Commandments. And then you might get more explicit preaching. There you go. Uh, Michael, thanks for your call from Michigan today. Dr. David Anders, thank you, sir. Well, thanks, Tom. We do this program Monday through Friday right here on EWTN Radio. 2 p.m. Eastern is our live broadcast. We bring it to you five days a week and very blessed to do so. Check out the podcast anytime you wish between shows. The address for that, EWTN.com slash radio. Look for the words Podcast Central. On behalf of our fantastic team here, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Hey, thanks for joining us. See you next time on Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. Have a wonderful day and God bless. The most original Catholic content is